Thank you for listening to Just Making Conversation. This is a very short episode about James and I who got invited to the Airfix launch of the new Seeking. We got home, we recorded, we forgot to do an intro, outro, because we were so excited. This is that edit. I apologise in advance. Please understand that we were both very excited about this whole thing. I know that we always joke about us not having any listeners, and I know that we do, and I appreciate every single one of you Here we go. On with the show. chopper <laughs> well, we got sea kings we we have have you opened yours i have yeah have you opened yours nope i haven't I have, it's still in its sipping box i've had a a, a gentle feel of all the sprues mm. all the recessed rivets mm. but i didn't touch the uh relief tube yeah i left that one alone for now it's not called a relief tube it's a p-tube yes it is Yes, the third thing that you build, ladies and gentlemen, on the Sea King is for your piss. Brilliant. Love it. <laughs> it is a sexist piss tube as well. You know, it wasn't designed for um, multi-sexes to use. Well, if your pilots are good at hovering, then it should be, they should be fine. Yeah, I think, I think there is an adaptation you can add to it. I didn't ask the question. So um, the young lady we spoke to, the only civilian female pilot to be able to fly a seeking helicopter. I didn't think that was appropriate to have that conversation of, well, anyway, when you're flying, how do you ever piss? I suppose so. I'll continue you just met as well. It's not a first date question. It really isn't, no. There is an adaptation, did you say? There must be an adaptation. The adaptation is something that Edward will bring out in Photo Etch? A Photo Etch adaption to the piss tube? Uh, well, yeah, like a conversion set. Well, I, th- I think that's uh, definitely a possibility. Um, I'm sure they haven't thought about it quite yet, but um, well, let's put it out there. Uh, Edward, we challenge you to um, to make a, a photo etch adaptation to the piss tube. I would like to see that diversity and inclusion. I think that's very important. I think we forget sometimes just how analog orientated sometimes these machines are. I did notice on the different Sea Kings that there were different sizes. Yeah, you were fascinated by the size of the Belgian piss tube. <laughs> in fact, actually, I think it would be fair to say you stood in awe of the size of the piss tube. Uh, only because it's the first thing you see when you walk in a Sea King. It's the first thing that's right in front of you. It's the third thing you build on the Airfix kit. It's a separate part, and it's chrome. You need something shiny to be here, let's be oh, honest. Yeah. Porcelain would be fine. I'm quite used to porcelain. Oh. I don't think I've ever put my penis in any shiny in metal, have you? <laughs> no no i gotta be honest it's not on my uh, to-do list maybe i should put that on there i want to be able to piss on a piss tube on a seeking although uh, i was told that uh, obviously when they have young technicians that um learning the ins and outs of the uh seeking one of the first things they do is they say to them this is the internal comms you have to shout down it interesting uh, and get your lips around it we, do you know what all day you're saying? We're going to start with the piss tube because that is just, yeah, it was just funny. Anyway, so yeah, so yesterday we were kindly invited by Airfix down to the historic helicopters site in Chard um, in Devon, I believe that is. Somerset. Sorry, I've just offended two counties in one go. I do apologise. But <laughs> but you're listening to Just Making Conversation. You have to expect that sort of thing. But yeah, we were there for the uh, secretive meeting with the, the Airfix team their new release of a new mould 148th uh, Western Sea King. And um, I can honestly tell you that the night before I was messaging Dow, who is the brand manager, indeed, and uh, and, and suggesting to him that it was a Sea King. And uh, there was a moment I saw in the text reply that he seemed a little worried that I might have cottoned on to what it was. No, he wasn't worried. 
but he's very he's very good at hiding that sort of thing. You thought it was a release of the Blue Tits. Well, you know what threw me, right? So let's go right back to the beginning. We get this invitation, super secret, can't tell no one. We're all together at a certain time on a certain date at an equestrian centre. Yes. So, of course, we busily Googled that and, and discovered what could be relevant and what wasn't. So I'm immediately thinking, oh, my God, the vision of Malcolm trotting around on the back of a horse I was super, super excited by that. But obviously, we were looking at the helicopters. Great thing about this particular place is they did do a documentary that was on television talking about the Sea King and what they're doing and what they hope to get going. And I remember one of the guys, it may have even been um, the owner. Andrew Whitehouse. I'm terrible with names. But I remember a quote from that program saying that they were told that it would never get any Sea Kings flying. Oh, when was this? Oh, probably beginning of the year I watched it. I'm sure it's been around for a little while. But within that series, they were talking about the the fantastic opportunity that a young lady had been given to be the first female civilian to be able to fly a Sea King. And it was awesome watching her, um, even though in the conversation we had on the day, she was quite upset that the the landing, the first ever landing she did uh, wasn't spot on perfect. It was a bit of a bounce involved, which i got to be honest, if you'd done it perfectly, I would have assumed it wasn't the first landing. So, But yeah, it was a really fascinating program. And uh, Seeking is one of the few aircraft that I can honestly say I've got a massive passion for. So... Super, super exciting. So anyway, enough of that dribble. So on the day we get there, we're not allowed to go upstairs to the meeting room. We, we gather for a cup of coffee uh, and bacon sandwiches. Chuck a block full of bacon. They were lush. Munched through some, some bacon rolls, had a chat, cup of coffee, caught up with all the people were there, several YouTubers, publications, editors and stuff. And then we were ushered upstairs. Now, yeah, so we couldn't talk about it pre- pre- before, but we were given a certain point in time, uh, which was uh, probably about a minute before they, they went live on YouTube, where we could publish anything we liked. Yeah, we had to be quiet, didn't we? We had to remain silent. So, of course, YouTubers were streaming live the whole event, sending posts out left, right and centre, uh, little teasers and all that sort of stuff. We had a little presentation, done a project, created the product, got it on a ship, a couple of days away from landing... It was revealed it was a 148th Sea King and then announced that it's going to be available in the shops within short order, which I think is a fantastic idea because that keeps the buzz going and also gives you a little time to finish up what's on your bench to get that new kit in and, and, and dribble all over it. I, I wonder how they managed to do that without accidentally leaking it or someone mentioning it or it, it coming out. But as far as I'm concerned, it was a complete surprise for everybody. Yeah. Obviously... Having the release at a historic helicopters where they have Sea Kings. Well, this this was the discussion we had, didn't we? Because you know they have got a few products in their classic range, which potentially they could have done uh, a release for. And, and as Dale said, was we wouldn't have gone to all this effort for a, a repop of something in the classic range. Well, he only said that after we found out what it was. So it could have been, uh, you know, a re-release of something, and um, we would have made the journey all the way down there for something. But trust in uh, the FX people. I know you wanted to get to the bacon sandwiches bit, but you have skipped ahead a little bit of the of the experience because we had to drive down <laughs> to this place early in the morning. You mm-hmm. left your place at five. I did uh, yeah. to get to mine. I drove you down through the <laughs> rolling hills oh, of Somerset. Beautiful, and I think I missed. A turning at one point. It was a 280 degree turning that I missed that um, I just didn't notice. And then um, I ended up going down a very, very small country road. It felt like we were going through like Jurassic Park at one point. Um, yes. <laughs> met by lots of tractors and things. But we got there, found it all right, didn't we? Yeah. Great yeah. big 18 feet airfix flag in the middle of nowhere. So after the presentation and everything, we were split into three groups. We were then privy to go around and have a tour of uh, where they have the outside hangar, which is about five minutes away, which they call King's Landing, which Uh is nice. And uh, also we had a tour of the engineering area, which was just literally behind where we were. Mm. You wouldn't wouldn't have known suddenly there was, uh, you know, five or six different helicopters all open in different stages of repair and 
and restoration where we were. It was, it was very well hidden. And that was incredible. The wonderful thing was as well, we were told not to get in the cockpits. However, we could climb over the air, airframe as long as we um, watched out for anything yellow or black, don't touch <laughs> on the pain of death. Well, the P-tube was chrome, so that was fine to touch. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, we climbed in and out of, of, um, uh, of lots of different air, airframes, talking to them about the, the wasp that they got there and the fact that it needs a new engine and uh, and all that sort of stuff. It, yeah, just it was just mind-blowing, really. And to watch people crawling over the aircraft, I mean, because one of the one of the Sea Kings was in mid repair. They were repairing the, the engine or working on the engine. Uh, we had the glory of being able to look straight into the order gubbins uh, because w- when we went into the, the little hangar, we were on a, a higher level, so we could oversee everything that was there. And the the mechanics were um, they had a chat with us. Um, clearly, the passion of the airframes that everyone has was extremely evident and even to the point that what amazed me even further was there's not just one the guy's got seven seeking airframes of which they hope to have six flying by the end of this year which is phenomenal Mm -hmm. so yeah that was that was pretty cool climbing in and out of the the airframes was quite funny especially watching malcolm got duck all the time and all that sort of thing so they had the uh widgeon yeah in the back corner Westland Widgeon. They had a Lynx in there. Uh-huh. They had the there was two Sea Kings in their hangar. Uh, one of them was in a jung- jungly livery, wasn't it? Yep. Camouflaged sides, and then the bright orange front. And apparently they had that because they, they had sold it in the camo, and then the Egyptians decided to change their minds, not didn't want to buy it anymore. So the Belgians then said, "Well, we don't want to bother repainting it. We'll just stick the the day glow on it. Day glow and camo." Yeah, it's a cracking scheme, um, and the, and like you say, the, the history of why it's like that is quite funny. Mm. The fact that it was all painted, ready to go over to Egypt, uh, knock down price, I'm sure. But it's a very, very well known scheme, and very, very much loved in in Belgium, mm. because they actually uh, a few weeks previous to our visit had actually gone over to Belgium for an air show, and they were amazed that they had a uh, hundred people in a queue within minutes mm. wanting to climb through the, the the airframe and have a look around it and the, the stories that were involved was fantastic um what was the what was the the, the first helicopter we got to because that wasn't the sea king was it it's western whirlwind the yellow thing the gentleman was telling us the history of uh, of the airframe a nice little story in the fact that they have these open days and they were saying they had a, a gentleman and a young lady visit they were talking about the airframe and doing their, their walk arounds and that sort of thing. And it suddenly emerged that this this woman had had a, a an interesting tale to tell, which the husband was like, oh, for crying out loud, will you stop banging on about it? <laughs> oh, here we go again. This young lady was a stunt double for one of the Bond girls and actually had been winched in the film and had pictures and all stuff on a, on a phone. And uh, she was happy to retell the, the story of how all it all went on. And uh, her husband sat there just going, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> I don't know why I bought you here. That was cool. What was great is they had, whatever question you asked, they were quite happy to tell you all about it. This yeah. Is, this is their bread and butter. Yeah, you know, no. we were like, "Can we stand on this bit?" Yes. Yeah. Okay. One of the things was I was trying to climb the stairs, and I said, "Oh, I don't know about it. it's a bit wobbly." He went, "It'll take your weight." I was like, "You sure?" I missed that. Really? Yeah, it'll take your weight. And I was like, "Well, of course it will. It's it's a massive helicopter that can lift like you know a hundred thousand tons. Of course it can take my weight." So anyway, yeah, hopped onto it. It wobbled a bit. I'm always a bit worried, worried about standing on things that wobble a bit. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so I got on that and. Yeah, they were really good. They were, if if they had a question, they would tell you about it, you know. And even they were telling you about things that you didn't even think to ask. You know, they're mm. asking, they're telling you about all the equipment inside that they had to take out and the equipment that's in there. Brilliant, really, really, really uh, good bunch of guys. So if you are near Chard or do love the Seeking, I highly recommend you get yourself along to Historic Helicopters. Look them up on Facebook, and their website is dot com. Huh, by, by the way. Um, and go and see them and go and visit their open day and show them some love because they they were awesome yeah your your support be well well uh, welcome because that was the other thing in which they were saying that obviously it's a charity um 
and and raising monies to to keep the airframes in flyable condition is obviously quite a lot of money. Some of the bread and butter work um, that they do, they do some film work, and that had had stopped because of the strikes and stuff that are currently uh, going on, which is a you know hits them financially, and the fact that uh, going to air shows wasn't viable because um, it was at their own cost uh, in many situations, which is a shame. It, it just mind blowing totally mind blowing and and to be honest i mean i don't don't think i said this to you on the day but (laughs) it it seemed quite funny to me because the the owner is actually a farmer that's his day job if you like and his partner is obviously into horses so they combine the two hobbies on the site and (laughs) walking from the first hangar to king's landing we were walking through stables uh, which which amused me quite a lot (laughs) <laughs> I don't know why, but it just did. Helicopters and horses. I, I was thinking maybe it's because they're on the same side of the dictionary. Maybe that's why. But they have to have a very special uh, relationship between the horses and the helicopters. Because once the helicopters are taken off and everything, it can scare the horses. And if you're running a, a big international show jumping event, which mm-hmm. they do do there, then you're going to have a big bad time. So they make sure that the, the horses are all sort of tied up and, and down before they launch any of the helicopters. Yeah. And vice versa, I imagine the Sea Kings probably get a bit jumpy when there's a horse running around. Yes, yeah, well, they, they can be a bit nervous. Yes. <laughs> King's Landing was three um, three airframes. There was the Belgian one, the uh, UK Air Sea Rescue, and Marine One. Clearly, the airframe had been painted for filming purposes. It was the Diplomat, I believe, Netflix series. They retold stories about the filming experience that they had, which they had great fun doing, but they had a lot of, as you can imagine in filming, one particular part they were filming was um, everyone climbing in and out of the, the airframe, but the airframe had to be, the rotors had to be running, and they shot and reshot and reshot and reshot <laughs> and then didn't use any of it. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's filming for you. What was the other thing he said? He was about uh, putting a camera underneath the airframe. So as it took off, they could they could take a shot of the helicopter taking oh, off. So they had to paint the underneath. Malcolm was quite distraught because obviously he was climbing underneath the, the airframe to see if it was painted. And knowing full well that he's got the model, uh, that he's going to have to paint the underneath. Uh, that's perfectly fine because you're going to be able to see the underneath, aren't you? So I'm quite happy to do so. That was quite cool. Talking to them about the, um, especially the Belgium airframe and the excitement they had received at the air show, was quite fascinating. Yeah, it's glad to hear actually because it's one of those airframes that we are very much missing. I think it's done its tour, it's done its thing, but to not see them around anymore is is upsetting. Well, it is to me anyway. They did their time, and a lot of people got a lot of good times in them. You know, they were very reliable, very leaky. As well, you know, I think they had a lot of uh, passion, uh, and you picked up on the amount of oil in in one of the parts. Didn't you? Oh yeah, I, I must say actually, before I forget, SC Rescue, it was actually the airframe that uh, our future king flew. So yeah, that's got a bit of history to it, which is pretty cool. But yeah, one of the things I did notice, it, it did leak. In all fairness, most military vehicles leak in some form. Uh, it seems to be a, a way for the engineers to know whether there's a problem or not, because as all of the engineers said, is if it's not leaking, mm. there's a problem. Or if it's not leaking, it's run out of oil. We went into the Marine One, spent a little bit of time in there, myself and Malcolm having a good look around and stuff. Mm. And um, I was sat in the rear position and, and sat down in, in awe, really, of, oh, well, it's quite a confined space. Yeah. And I wasn't sure. I was sat there thinking to myself, oh, do you know, I'm not sure in flight whether I could cope with this because I couldn't see where I was going. But I guess looking at the screens and stuff, I'd be pretty busy. So it wouldn't really be that much of a problem. But on the desk itself was a puddle of oil, which I didn't notice before I sat down. And I was just like, oh, oh there's oil everywhere. And then looked on the floor and there was oil on the floor as well. That was then the, the, the radar operator's little booth, wasn't it? That's right, yeah, and um, I I I picked that I picked this up with one of the engineers and said, "Is that is that like a normal thing?" And apparently, there is uh, all the ele- electronics is tested with a drip factor. The electronics will work fine as long as the rate of the drip of oil onto the electronics is at a certain rate. If it gets too fast, then it can cause a problem. <laughs> Um, and if it stops, then they've run out of oil. <laughs> so yeah, which I thought was quite <laughs> quite hilarious, really, to think that our forces guys uh, are in that sort of environment it, yeah just 
it feels strange. I don't know why. It just does feel real strange. But like we said, you know, we were talking outside and, and there are some airframes that um, leak fuel until they get to a certain height. Oh, like the Batbird or something, yeah. It's a normal thing, I guess. If it works, it doesn't matter if it looks pretty, you know, if it does the job. That's right. And then, once we'd have a look around the Marine One, they, they got us out of the way, didn't they? Yeah. They wanted to do something. Yeah, so Marine One's, it's uh, right, it was all out, looking pretty. And they, they basically wanted to start the engine up, uh, which is a nice test for the engine. But also, part of that process is it gives them the ability to fold the rotors away um, to then obviously make it easier to store. I, I didn't realise that they had to, if they wanted to fold the rotors away, the engine had to be powered up. Yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't sure because I, I actually, because when they said they were going to turn it over, I was thinking to myself, well, there's, there's two horses not far away. Surely you're not going to get the rotors going. And busy filming it, um, which I will put up on the Facebook page, I'm busy filming it and thinking to myself, oh, they're not going around. What are they doing? And then all of a sudden realised that's what they were doing. They were folding the things away. <laughs> For a moment, there was a moment of anti-climax of, oh, is that it? Really? Oh, obviously that they have to have the engine going to, to fold away the, the thing. So that was quite a lesson in itself uh, and quite an operation as well, because obviously the guys outside of the airframe are making sure they fold away in the correct manner. Wasn't helping, but were guiding, I think would be the right phrase, to the uh, the last rotors in the fold, if you like. Yeah, well, they've got to make sure they go in the right place. They've got to make sure everyone's out of the way. They've got to make sure that the engine is is running nicely. So it was, what, one, two, three, four, six people involved in that operation? Just fold the... Yeah, just just to fold them back. Yeah, um, but it was lovely hearing it starting up. Um, oh, yeah. Which I've got some nice audio for, which I'll, I'll probably use as the open... Yeah, I think you may have already heard it. Yeah, and, and we were told in no certain terms that we needed to just put things in our ears, fingers, because there was nothing else to use. You could have put some cheese in there. Well, yeah, but the cheese was back in the venue on the table, and I didn't think, oh, I'll pick a bit of cheddar up so I can put that in my ears for later. You know, it wasn't wasn't on my uh, on my radar. Mm. see what i did there so yeah so uh that that was that was the climax of, of the the event and then that was it they turned it off and we all clapped and uh we all sauntered yep. back past marine one through the horses <laughs> <laughs> back up to the conference room where we were then given the chance to leave as 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 f we wanted to we could ask questions have a chat a little bit more also got to look at the model kit too Mm, yes all laid out did you get much chance to look at the kit then or did you have you had a look at the kit when you got home i did have a look at it when it was on the table so on the table they had a, a naked seeking and then they had the the different schemes all laid out there as well but they also had the sprues and the decals and the instructions and all that sort of stuff so yeah i, I managed to have a little look uh it was <laughs> Uh, it was a, a crowded table for some time because people were taking pictures, taking videos, yeah. talking about it live and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was busy. But looking at the 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 kit itself, um, I, I have actually managed to unbox the kit at home. And um, one of the things Dale said was that um, that they'd been very conscious about the way it was going to be packed and that the the inside wouldn't move around during transportation, which he's not wrong. Mm -hmm. It was jam packed. Mm -hmm. Put into not not all the sprues put into separate bags, which can be a bit of a bugbear for people, but only a couple of sprues in bags. Mm -hmm. None of the the paper that you saw in the twenty fourth which fire mm -hmm. that will upset some people maybe or uh, what do you mean the paper? Well if you remember on the twenty fourth uh Spitfire um the, yeah. the main fuselage was not in a bag it was wrapped in in brown paper uh, uh, and it was part of part of their uh, attempt at trialing to see whether a model kit would um that way of packaging would be a greener but also um would it would it affect the sprues and all that bits and pieces itself um mm -hmm. and i think to be honest it was quite a successful trial um and i was I wasn't disappointed per se, but I was like, "Oh, that's a shame." I, I would right. have, I would have liked to have seen that throughout the whole kit, to be honest, because I think a piece of paper folded over with all the sprues in between would have worked relatively well. Not on all sprues, because some of the sprues are smaller, but certainly mm. the larger sprues, I would have thought that would, that could have worked. So, well, maybe it's because the, the, so this kit's made in China, so maybe they just didn't have that option, because uh, the seeking, I'm oh, sorry, the Spitfire was. 
done in the UK. That's right. So they had more of a chance to do that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's. I think, like I said, I think the the twenty fourth was a a trial to see mm. a if it worked for them and B, whether the consumer thought it was a good idea, et cetera. And I seem to remember Dale saying that at the time. Maybe that's something that will roll out at some point, or maybe the feedback they've had has not been as positive as, as they'd hoped. Don't know. I will ask right. Dale next time I speak to him. Felt like a bit of a step backwards, if I'm honest, in my yeah. opinion. Um, but okay. that didn't make any difference to the sprues. They were all nice and tightly bundled together, all in uh, really big bags, actually. Um, bigger than the sprues themselves, folded over and then heat sealed. I always found that when I'm putting sprues back in the box, I can never get them back in the same way. And then yeah, wonder why now, the lid don't fit. So is it that tight that you might have that issue? Yes. Now, I would advise anyone that does get the kit and they obviously want to smell the sprues, so to speak, uh, that they take note in the way the sprues are laid because they are laid in a particular way that they fit very snugly into the box. Right. Um so, um, yeah, that's something to watch out for. And, and I, t- I mean, um, as those that have, um, are listening to that, this at the moment, they'll see that on the, the um, Just Making Conversation page is a blog. Uh, this time I decided instead of doing a video, I'd do a blog about what I thought the kit was like, what the experience was like that we had on the day, etc. So you'll see on that blog that right at the bottom are all the pictures of all the sprues Mm. all nicely laid out for you. So yes, I did take them out of the bag and yes, I had to take note of how they were laid so they could go back in the box properly. Okay. Um, And uh, if you, if you do get them in slightly the wrong order, um, they do create a problem when you're trying to put the lid back on the box. Yeah. So yeah, watch out for that. Okay. But yeah, so the, the sprues themselves, nice and clean, Great plastic. Uh, obviously, the, the the formula in which they've gone with with all their new, or, or are going with in, with all their new um, products at the moment. Um, no, n- you know, no no faults that I could see on the way the sprues were at all in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, something I've been reading actually today is the um, the modeler's reaction to rivets. We do love a, love a rivet counter. Oh, has there been rivet drama already? There has been a little bit of rivet drama. Now, the reason for that is the rivets are recessed. They are not sticky out rivets. Um, and the, some people are a little disappointed for that. They don't really understand um, why that would be, uh, why it would be easier to do recessed rather than a non-recessed. Racist? <laughs> recessed. Oh. What, what I feel uh, you need to remember is that the... The scale of the of the subject, because it's recessed, doesn't detract, I think, away from the appeal of, of, of the, the, the subject matter itself. Um, now, I haven't obviously built it, and I haven't painted it or anything like that. Um, and the thought of having rivets that are, are pronounced rather than recessed, I sort of I see the point they're making, but there are thousands and thousands of, of rivets on that thing. Mm. Um and I'm sure there was um, a, a reason for it um, that they chose to go that way. So as they, they have always said to us, that every time we've gone down there, the designers uh, have always said there are sometimes challenges that you have uh, producing scale that you have to make a compromise on. And I think that was a compromise they made. Right. Uh, but the feedback generally from people that I've been reading, uh, most people seem to have, have um, been quite happy with with what they're seeing. Yeah. Um, and those that are, I don't want to call them rivet counters, those that are that are perplexed by the rivet situation, they are uh, voicing their opinions as to um, how difficult could it be, et cetera. So, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, but generally speaking, it seems to be going down really well. There's quite a few videos out there already, breakdown of, of the kit itself, um, as well as the event. I will be making it at some point, and I'm hoping I'm going to get to it fairly soon, but I can't promise. Making the kit? Making the kit itself, yeah. So, Are you going to make it this year? Yes. Yeah, the plan is to get it done uh, in the coming months. Um, I've got a few, <laughs> he says, looking around at a dozen things on his bench. Mm. I've got a few things in which I need to attend to first, but as soon as they're done, that is my plan, is to pull the kit out and give it a good going over. So when I do that, what I will do is I will continue the blog theme and do a breakdown of the build as I do it, okay. uh, rather than doing a video, because I'm sure there'll be plenty out there anyway. But Yeah, I've already seen a couple, I think. 
So I just thought it'd be nice to do do it written. God help me. Uh, and my dyslexia. But hey-ho. What about you? Have you, you had a look through the kit itself? Well, dude, I haven't even opened the box. Oh. It's still in the shipping box, look. Oh, I see the passion I've got for this model, honestly. Well, it's not that I don't have the passion. It's just I've been bloody busy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've got number 17 of 40. Oh, I don't know what number I had. Yeah, and it's in this packing box. Because I was given it by Airfix as a gift, and because I was there under the, the, the models for heroes, same with I felt about the Spitfire, uh, the 24 scale one, because I gave that one away to get built. So I might do the same with this one. Mm-hmm. But what, for what I did see of the sprues, they looked brilliant. Mm. You're talking about the, the recessed and proud rivets. Um, I was just looking on my photographs to see how it looks compared to the, the actual kit. You know, just trying to find something that I can compare it to. I think you're right. I think it's down to size and scale. Because looking at the rivets, they are comparatively very not sticky outy at all. There's lots of mm. them, sure. And perhaps if they were sticky outy, you wouldn't be able to get a wash on them. Well, I think if I remember correctly, Luke did mention it um, in the, in his presentation, and, and it was a conscious decision to do that. And also, I mean, this wasn't said, but what I would assume is that when they make the mold, obviously the, the, the mold is made out of steel, and then um, they do the one bit that he told us. I was I was fascinated about, and and uh, I will colour him at some point for a longer chat, but. So obviously you've got your your main mould that's made out of steel and then some of the details are actually imposed onto the steel using copper, etc. And Mm. I can't be any more technical than that, so forgive me if I've got that a little bit wrong. But So I'm assuming that obviously if if you've got um, a mould that has pronounced rivets, that's a lot of extra work, a lot of extra money and effort of which potentially as the mould gets older may incur extra costs for maintaining etc so maybe that's a choice uh, a part or part of the choice mm. but certainly i don't in this scale i don't think it really detracts from it however with that said if you do buy the kit and you decide to fill in your rivets and make them pronounced let me know how you get on because i would be interested yeah i remember him saying something about that and i guess maybe i just phased out at that point because um it did seem fascinating but also incredibly technical about the, mm. the way that they on the weld these tiny tiny parts on into i think the- it was matt actually that said it not luke sorry oh was it okay but yeah yeah maybe they should do a, a video or something on that or maybe we should interview him or something and find out because it certainly is fascinating but yeah it's something i hadn't i hadn't even noticed i mean there is pronounced detail on there the, the, you know different bumps and whistles and all that sort of thing are pronounced mm. but yeah all the rivets are are recess but i mean it's certainly detailed oh god yeah the details amazing though you know even the overlapping panels uh, i think i i may have mentioned this several times on the day that there were things that i spotted on the airframe that i'd never realized that were there like the anti-slip paint yeah. in on the on the side of the fuselage and certainly overlapping panels i'd never would have yeah, twigged yeah. that um, unless i'm standing next to it and certainly that has been achieved really well and i know i know matt went through that um, explaining that he, it was quite difficult, uh, a bit of a game of, um, was it Tetris, he said, or something like that, I think? Yes, grown-up Tetris. It did, it did tickle me, but lots of conversations with himself on the way home from work, um, discussing how he was going to get that effect right. Uh, so, that, yeah, uh, so <laughs> yeah. I can imagine the <laughs> the, 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 the conversations yeah. and uh, the arguments he must have had with himself as well. So, yeah, I, th- I think that the, the detail-wise, they've done an amazing job. I mean, even to the point where, although you're not going to see it, the radar part inside, uh, you've got two options. You can have it as a blank screen, uh, so it's, it's a decal that's dark, or you can have it as a lit up screen, which is a, a, a green uh, decal, which I thought was a brilliant touch. <laughs> and forgive me, I, I know I shouldn't do this, but I was actually thinking now, how yeah. on earth can I do <laughs> achieve that? So I can put the decal on top of a clear screen with a light behind it. Not that you're going to ever see it, but just because I knew it, I, I could do it. Just whizzing through the the instructions that I've got out of the box in front of me. I mean, obviously, we've made pen- mention to it. The P tube uh, on on the the third stage of your build. I think we've mentioned it enough. I think we should try and try and do this section of the podcast without mentioning urine or penises. <laughs> 
I wasn't going to mention anything like that at all. You've got options as you go through. You do need to choose right at the beginning, actually, scooting back a little bit, which particular variant you're going to do because there are some uh, internal differences, some uh, holes to drill out on the floor and all that sort of stuff, and obviously some differences on the outer side as well. I noticed that the uh, the anti slips are actually decals. Just notes that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm very. I am intrigued by the anti slips. Yeah, you are. You got a thing about your anti slips, haven't you? You think? You think about them? I have. Yeah, it really puzzled me why you would have anti slip on the side of an airframe, because surely the only time you're going to use anti slip on the side of an airframe is when it's on its side. And to be honest, it's a bit too late to worry about slipping. Well, the guy, like the guy said, if you if you do kind of lose your footing, at least you've got something to yeah. to get some sort of purchase on with your foot or with your hand. But also, he said they use it as protection from the actual aircraft. Yes, yeah, yeah. It yeah. makes complete sense, but you know. So yeah, going through the instructions. So there there is a lot of detail um, in which you have to put together the interior, especially is as I said, there are different formats in which you can have. You can have the seats all the way along the sides, or you can have different seating positions for uh, your rescue and all that sort of stuff. And, um, uh, yeah, just just amazing. I mean, one fact one fact that I didn't realise was that when you even got uh, Air Sea Rescue, the person standing on the door has the ability to move the aircraft slightly uh, because the pilot allows them to have that control. I, I, I never knew that. Yeah, they got 10% hover control if the pilot gives it to them. And also, I didn't realize that there's um, the, the window at the back, the bulbous window, you can actually s- sort of stick your head right out of, which I actually, I've sent you a photograph on Messenger if you want to have a look. Mm. If you stick your head out of that, you can actually use a spotlight and down to underneath the aircraft. So if you were rescuing someone, you could spot them. On some airframes, it actually comes with a big spotlight on the interior, but also the, the pilot can control a spotlight from the front as well. Yeah. Oh, there's lots of stuff hanging off these things, isn't there? There's lots of bits and bobs. Yeah. It's not sleek at all. No. And like I said, you know, there's a, a lot of things that you don't realise until you get up close and personal. Mm. Because I am I'm a little bit of a fan of, of the Sea King, and I, I certainly didn't realise some stuff. So, If you're thinking of building it this century, which one are you thinking of, of putting together? The one I'm actually going to do is the number 771 uh, Naval Air Squadron, uh, which is the Royal Navy Station called Rose. Okay. HU-5. So that is basically an air-sea rescue, ocean grey, with some nice orange on the tail and the nose. That's the one that I I particularly like. I mean, the other choice is Heli Operations from Portland. Mm-hmm. Which is an orange, orange sort of nosy set. I think actually the um, cold road is red. Yeah, you've got those two, and then you've got um, a dark navy blue. Yeah, the original. Um, yeah, the original one. So the box art one, and then there's one more as well that you can do. Which again, I haven't got that one in front of me. But so there's, there's four good options, uh, and they are very different in the way they look. So yeah, so I'm go- I'm going to go with the cold road one because I just think that looks super sexy. Okay, that's the one that they feature in the little magazine as well, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and loads of lovely references. The thing looks super greasy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Going back to the instructions of us quickly, um, one thing I did notice as I was thumbing my way through is there is no engine detail. Yep. However, that's a good opportunity for our aftermarkets to, to get on that. And to be honest, if, if you, you fancy a bit of scratch building, I would semi say it wouldn't be that complicated to achieve if you wanted to. Mm. Well, we 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 saw yeah. the valves all opened up, didn't we? There's it's a lot of parts that you can open up in the front and the back and the sides and everything else. And, and they did say that there is there is space in the engine compartment, yeah, to be able to do so. You know, there's no struts or anything in there, so you could open it up. There, there is a void in which you can quite happily fill, definitely. So yeah, so um, again, going back to the instructions, you've then got the option of whether you're going to have your your tail and out normally or folded the rotors as well you can have folded or halfway you can have halfway you could you could do what you like this is this is what i like there's just so many options that you can you can achieve and play with this i did hear i think it might have been alex actually and he was saying his comment was i quote Hmm. you may want to buy yourself two or three of these He's not wrong. He really <laughs> isn't wrong because in the literature in which they gave us, there's the four schemes lined up next to each other, and that does look pretty cool. I've got to be honest. Yeah, it does. The instructions themselves—you've obviously got your rotor blades, etc. That's quite complicated. 
Well, they were talking about the rotor blades, weren't they, um, at length, and mm. how important it was to get it right. Because it's right on the very top of the aircraft. So looking down on it, you're going to see that right in front of you. Trying to understand themselves how the rotor blades worked and how they would pivot and everything else was quite a, an endurance task for them. But I think they I think they got it. It looks pretty good from the photographs that I've seen. All in all, you've got 186 steps in which to follow on your instructions. Quite a meaty book. And the instructions, as they are at the moment, um, with the way they're doing them, they're not black and white. There are some colour parts to it to explain what you're doing, where things are going and what your options are and all that sort of thing. Right. So I think the steps are really broken down well, explained fully. Mm. So, yeah, I cannot wait to start fiddling with it. Are you going to do yours in flight? The plan is to do it with um, everything folded. And that's that's a conscious choice because I want to make sure I've got the room for another one maybe in the future. Oh, did I say that out loud? Oops. It's all right. No, no one's listening. Can't wait to see it built, mate. Yeah, it's it was a fantastic opportunity. It's a fantastic kit. And uh, before anyone puts a comment, uh, no, we are not being paid to say that. Uh, all our views and thoughts on this are our own. Oh, yes, that's true. That was something I also saw uh, on on a video not that long ago. Do we have to do we have to say that, or is that legally required? I don't think it is. No, it's not legally required at all. I mean, if, so, if someone wants to pay us to say whatever they want, then please do let me know. Yeah. <laughs> As Winston from Ghostbusters said, if there's a decent paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've mean, referenced I've... Ghostbusters twice. Literally, you beat me to it. I was just thinking, well, what is it with Ghostbusters? <laughs> anything else? Any other business? As Jonathan Mock would say on his show, any other business? Well, the only other thing, obviously, is the Mooseroo. Just a, a quick reminder that with the the reveal of what is in the box. Hang on, hang on. You're obviously out of practice. You can't just barrel in to the Mooseroo without doing the Mooseroo jingle. Yes, yeah, sorry. Let me, let me. Oh, there's the old Malaysia. Oh, Mooseroo Cup. The Mooseroo Cup. Let's talk about the Mooseroo Cup. Boom. Right. Okay. Uh, now we've got that out of the way. Uh, yes. Yeah, so just to remind you that obviously I haven't opened the box yet. Uh, oh, it's four more days to go. And then we can open the box of goodiness and um, see what I've been stitched up. I mean, uh, what uh, delights I've got to. Uh... <laughs> Are we going to do it live with you open it? Well, uh, I, we haven't discussed this as in the true tradition of just making conversation. But yes, I think we probably should. So you're going to open it at midnight on the 1st, UK time. What what, what day is that, is that the 1st? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> uh, okay, the 1st of August is the Tuesday. So you could do a late night Monday reveal. Oh. Because um... this is going to go out on the 31st, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. You could do that if you were up for that. Ah, let's do it. What can go wrong? Okay, so uh, you will have listened to this, potentially, and then be going, oh, my God, is it going to do it live? When is that? <laughs> Tonight. Tonight. Did you set that up? I will I will write that down in the notes. You don't write anything down. Listeners, he just says I'll write that down and just carries on staring at me. Oh, I won't forget. Awesome. Right, are we done? Are we done talking about Sea Kings? We are. Oh. Thank you to FX. Thank you to Historic Helicopters. Thank you to everyone that was there who... Um, put up with our silly questions messing around thank you to all the uh all the listeners who uh, listened both of you thank you very much don't know if you noticed but we have actually just put a post up saying that we've got a thousand followers on the facebook page so thank you mum for pressing that a thousand times i'm really grateful a thousand followers on our facebook page apparently so good lord what's wrong with thousands of people <laughs> what are they doing you got nothing better to do Follow a, uh, a badly made podcast. I think the algorithms of Facebook just keep throwing it up and people just get tired and go, all right, I'll follow it. Okay, well, whoever paid the bot to press it a thousand times, thank you very much. <laughs> cool. All right, buddy. Take care of yourself. See you later, all. Bye. Bye.